In this lecture segment, we are still in the late antique period and are talking about the Emperor Constantine, how he used art and how art changes over the course of the Roman Empire. We're focusing on depictions of later Roman leaders, including the Tetrarchs and Constantine. In order to explore the shifts in art during this time, we need to examine the changing fortunes of the Roman Empire. All of that glue that we talked about, buildings, aqueducts, images of the emperor, is just not enough to keep the empire fully together, and things start shifting, not dramatically, but gradually. They attempt a new approach to make the empire easier to manage and split it into two halves, a western and an eastern part. And instead, of, instead of having one emperor for all, they have two for each half, a senior member or Augustus and a junior member or Caesar, so that they can be a check on each other's power. And we end up right here with something called the Tetrarchy, the rule of four. And here you can see the Augustus of Prima Porta from the beginning of the Roman Empire compared to a depiction of the Tetrarchs from late in Roman history. A pretty glaring difference in these two depictions of emperors, showing a really massive change in the representation of emperors over the course of the empire. Gone is Roman idealism, rooting works of art in the Greek Visual Foundation. Gone is Roman natural, naturalism, rooting works of art in that heritage of death masks and portraiture that we talked about. In their place here with the Tetrarchs, we have a work of art that stresses a symbol, meaning, and message over making something look like the natural world. The sculpture is embedded into the Basilica of San Marco, the major church in Venice today, so you can go and have lunch while sitting next to the Tetrarchs. We have smaller than life-size depictions of the four leaders with no individuality. Big staring eyes, sausage-like arms and legs, not released from the stone, but very much united with the porphyry block. Remember, this is the same purple stone we saw used at the Pantheon. It spoke of royalty and power to a viewer at this time, so it was a really wise material to choose to create a work of art ex attempting to express unity and power of leadership. And as we get closer to it, you can see more clearly the visual language being used. Each pairing is completely united to the other through embrace, similar appearances and in how they are carved. It might, might, might remind you of the coffre from Egypt, that the figures are not fully removed from the stone, but are still united to the block of this durable, hard-to-carve stone. One of the pairing has a beard, the Augustus, and the other of the pairing is clean-shaven, the Caesar or junior member, a clear visual cue of age and status. All sense of the individual is gone. These figures stand for all tetrarchs, not for specific persons. Even though Augustus never aged in his depictions, he was still recognizable. These figures are not about specific people, but about their office, their job, about keeping the empire together, even while being ruled by four. This work of art is still propaganda like the Augustus, but the artist used a different set of stylistic material and iconographic tools to communicate the message to the viewer. And that message is more important here than sticking with the usual naturalistic Roman approach to depicting the natural world. One of the men who was a tetrarch is Constantine, who was the Caesar in the western portion of the empire. The Augustus was Maxentius. Constantine wanted more power and wanted to be the ruler of the Western Empire, so he took on Maxentius at the Battle of Milvian Bridge. Constantine fell into a trance, had a vision in which he was told by a deity to have his soldiers add the Cairo to their shields or bodies. The Cairo is the first two letters of Christ's name in Greek, Christos, which was a commonly used symbol for Christ among early Christians at this time. After they mark themselves with the symbol of Christ, they win. So Constantine won the battle by declaring allegiance to Christ and by the will of God. He rules just the western portion of the empire, but then he expands his control to become the emperor of the whole empire. And he effectively used art and architecture to reaffirm his rule and eventually to support Christianity in a really pivotal way that's going to change the course of the western world. This depiction of Constantine tells us much about this story. We have the surviving head, a bicep, a hand, a knee, and a couple of incredibly huge feet, as you can see in this reconstruction. This is a massive sculpture that would have occupied the apse of a huge basilica where Constantine held court when in Rome. This is a basilica structure that Maxentius had built and used as an audience hall. You can see the location of the basilica in Rome here. 
And here is a view of what has survived from the structure. Remember, basilicas were structures used for secular purposes in Rome, similar to a courthouse or a town hall. This one is a massive structure made possible by Roman engineering. Round arches, barrel vaults, groin vaults, concrete to create a massive open space. And like we discussed at Dura Europis, niches or alcoves tend to be used in architecture at this time to mark special spaces. We call that space an apse at a basilica structure. So the apse of this structure is marked by the red rectangle, and Maxentius used it as an audience hall. So people coming to have an audience with him would enter from the right and head down the long axis marked in turquoise. A basilica is a longitudinal structure and is organized a line from one end to the other. The central space is called a nave. After Constantine beat Maxentius, he had this colossal image of himself installed in the apse where Maxentius would have sat to receive supplicants. You can see it right here. And then he reoriented the structure by adding a new apse marked in blue where he could hold court, creating a new entrance for the structure across from the new apse. You can get a feel for the size and depth of the app space that would have been filled with this colossal image. He uses imagery of himself to show territory, to claim the power of Maxentius as his own, looking much more like a god than a secular leader. This colossal depiction of him has these huge symmetrical eyes that we have not seen since the early days of Greek art. It's a schematic image of the body and abstracted to a degree or removed from nature pulling away from showing what we see with our eyes. These are the images of emperors that we've studied. The colossal depiction of Constantine has much more in common with the tetrarchs, the stylized depiction of the body, the huge eyes. Both emphasize message over showing the world on a human scale and with an accurate representation of the natural world. In this group of images, you can see the trajectory of Roman art moving from a representational mode or making something look naturalistic and often idealized here to instead emphasizing symbolic language and prioritizing meaning or message over making an object look like the natural world. But we also see Constantine trying to use the established tradition of emperor portraits to his best advantage to underscore his rule. Scholars argue that he used his imagery to place himself within the same category as the good emperors like Trajan or Augustus. If we compare the head of Augustus and a depiction of Trajan, remember his triumphal column, with the head of Constantine, we can actually see similarities. They're clean shaven, long faces with short hair, they're relatively young, and they're also really calm in contrast to the fretful, intense, furrowed brows of the Tetrarchs. Constantine is relaxed and gazes not at the world around him, but instead looks up at the heavens. Constantine was pretty shrewd about how he used art and architecture during his reign. We've talked about the Triumphal Arch and its purpose to honor the accomplishments of emperors and to memorialize these processions through Rome when after conquest emperors would parade through the streets, a triumphal entry. Constantine, following the pattern of early emperors, had a triumphal arch as well, right in the middle of, the Ro of Rome, right next to the Colosseum. The Arch of Titus was built to honor his squashing the rebellion of the Jews and bringing booty, looted treasures stolen from the Jewish temple to Rome. And remember that one right here. The Arch of Constantine refers to his triumphal procession after beating Maxentius at the Battle of Milvian Bridge. But here in the turquoise box on the Arch of Constantine, we see a depiction of the ceremony from when Constantine processed into Rome after winning the Battle of Milvian Bridge and becoming emperor over the West. This relief was carved for this monument, for the Arch of Constantine. And the style looks a lot like what we saw with the Tetrarchs. But other sculptures on the Arch of Constantine were not made for him by artists of his day. The two tondo, or circular panels, here and here, were taken from a monument to the good emperor Hadrian, an earlier emperor. And then Constantine had the depictions of Hadrian re-carved to resemble him or his father. And then they were given a new home on Constantine's arch. We refer to these repurposed sculptures as spolia, objects taken from one place and then moved to a new place. And this was not accidental. Constantine and his advisors are doing this with purpose and intention because they only took stuff from monuments to the good emperors. He is using art to show his legitimacy to rule and to show that he is like the great emperors of the past. It's a form of propaganda. 
targeted, carefully designed imagery intended to direct the beliefs of people, especially imagery that comes from a government. And Constantine used it very effectively in his efforts to keep the empire together and to solidify his claim to be emperor.